to introduce Charlotte, she's now arrived. Um, I'll let her in and we might as well start from there and then hand over to Paul, yeah? Sure, yeah, sure. 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 So I just you, started Shippen. recording the session. Brilliant. Over to you, Shippen. Yes, perfect. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the um, Ministerial Thematic Forum site event, uh, Leveraging Modern Energy Access for All, uh, Infrastructure, Climate and Cooking. This event is hosted by the Government of Kenya in collaboration with the Africa Europe Foundation, Clean Cooking Alliance, Energia, the International Network on Gender and Sustainable Energy, the Modern Energy Cooking Services Program, and the Energy Nexus Network. So yeah, it's my honor today to, to welcome you to this side event. Um, before we start the session, I just want to share some uh, quick housekeeping guidelines with you. Joni, if you can go to the next slide. Um, please all note that today's side event is being recorded. The recordings and slides will be available on next.org.uk, but also on the UN Energy Network platform. Um, all participants, with the exception of the speakers, will be muted by the host. So we kindly ask that you make sure that you're muted and your video is off. Um, unfortunately, we have a well, fortunately, we have a very packed schedule, but this means that we might not be able to address all the questions that you have. But please be sure to put your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them directly in the chat. Um, this event is, um, as you all know, probably a part of a series of activities being held this week as part of the ministerial thematic forums, a key milestone in the preparation for the high level dialogue on energy taking place in uh, September. Um, next slide, Johnny. Yeah, the, then the agenda for today is as follows. We'll start with some opening remarks provided by two senior representatives from the government of Kenya. And we have the honor to, uh, to welcome uh, a senior representative from the UK, from FCDO. Uh, this will be followed by a brief technical presentation, a panel discussion with experts, and finally some closing remarks. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to um, Professor Charlotte Watts, the Chief Scientific Advisor of the UK Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, formerly known as DFID. Please, uh, Professor Charlotte Watts, go ahead. Let's see. OK, so we're still waiting. Um, I just noticed that she hadn't been made a presenter. Charlotte, I'm very sorry. Um, you're now uh, able to speak and to share your, your video. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Brilliant. Thank you. I was I was scared I was doing something wrong at my end. On this. Apologies. <laughs> no, the joys of the joys of technology. Um, just to say, I'm really delighted to be able to hear to join this session and, and I have I want to give my thanks to the government of Kenya, as well as the representatives from other international organisations for inviting me to the ministerial forum today. And I'm pleased that despite the significant challenges of COVID that the world faces right now, that we're having this meeting um, and that we, the clean cooking sector, has continued to advance its knowledge base, um, building on decades of global effort um, to really identify how, through global cooperation, we can really realis realistically address the serious global challenges related to energy and cooking. Um, and I'm particularly motivated by how do we tackle important challenges relating to gender equality, poverty alleviation, health and climate. So over the past decade, um, UK Aid has supported solutions to the challenge of clean cooking. And for example, we've been working with the Clean Cooking Alliance, which was formerly the Global Alliance for Clean Cooking, to bring about greater safety and opportunities for women and girls, including creating the business environment for the sector to thrive. We've also worked with the World Bank 
to bring evidence data to the clean cooking sector. And also our efforts on cooking as it relates to the impacts of uh, on premature deaths caused by household air pollution. And all of this work and all of these partnerships, I think, have led us to this point of very advanced and evidence based thinking that could bring about real change. The commitment to advancing clean cooking solutions has not changed, but what um, the drive for tech and innovation to support this change. I think has, has just got stronger and stronger over the years. And we hope that the work undertaken through the Mon Modern Energy Cooking Service program, which Professor Ed Brown will speak about shortly, as well as the work on that, why others really points the way towards realistic, affordable, and genuinely clean cooking solutions in advance of 2030. With our presidency of COP, um, in Glasgow uh, later this year, um, we have a strong focus on not only on um, how do we mitigate future emissions, but also how do we support clean energy access? Um, and uh, how do we enable action that will make enable us to make progress both on climate and bias biodiversity uh, agendas? And indeed, this is very much a top foreign policy priority for the UK. So within these joint agendas, we see the um, Energy Sustainable Development Goal 7 and the Clean Cooking Goal within that as essential to enabling the just and inclusive energy transition, which the high level dialogue thematic reports have called for. Whilst the pandemic has led to the UK making very tough temporary decisions about the aid budget, um, we are still very committed to this agenda and, and some of the, the difficult cuts that we've had to, uh, 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 that have resulted from, from tough decisions, bears no reflection to our past and present commitment to this sector. Um, and I'm still very proud and pleased that the UK funding has since 2011 provided an estimated 33 million people with improved access to clean energy and avoided 31 million tonnes of greenhouse um, uh, gas emissions. Um, but there's so much that we can do, we, we need to do collectively. Um, for us, we need new evidence on, um, from MEX on the affordability of electric cooking and low energy appliances. Um, and um, we, we, need, we need evidence that we can use in our country offices and around the world on what might be possible. And we think the evidence that's starting to be generated will help us to continue to drive markets and sector forward to achieve the ambitious goals that we have. I think particularly we've seen progress has been slower than maybe we have hoped um, on cooking in particular. So in the nine years that we have left to achieve the 2030 goals under SDG 7, it's going to be really important that we generate the best evidence to inform our thinking on this. New opportunities may also mean, for instance, that new groups need to speak to each, speak to each other. So, for example, cooking appliance innovators and national utilities groups and national energy policy makers, as well as behavioural researchers. Um, as well as bringing in some of the pay-as-you-go financiers. And we've seen great success in bringing in some of those innovative financing and some of the other clean energy technologies that we've, that we've supported. New opportunities may also require a mix of clean fuel solutions to satisfy different contexts. Um, and data has also been a perennial problem for the sector. And whilst there are lively debates about energy choices and stacking, for instance, our efforts need to be expanding the range of clean, healthy, affordable and aspirational choices for people to cook in their homes and in their businesses. So I'm going to end there. But as the chief scientist and FCDO, um, my closing mark and my closing plea is are and continue to be informed by a sound evidence base in order to drive our success to 2030. But also that we continue to harness the best of innovation and technology alongside 
the powerful insights from social and behavioral si uh, science to address this key, key, this key global challenge. So with that, I wish you all a very productive session um, and very much looking forward to the presentations ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Watts, for those remarks. Uh, we will now go to uh, the representative of the government of Kenya, Mr. Paul Mbuthi, who is the deputy director of the Renewable Energy at the Ministry of Energy in Kenya. Please go ahead, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Shukri. And uh, let me start by recognizing Professor Charlotte Watts, uh, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. We would like, first of all, to appreciate the support of the co-hosting organizations and all the colleagues who have been working hard to prepare this event. I'm making these remarks on behalf of my principal secretary, uh, who is not able to join us uh, this evening. It gives me great pleasure to make a few remarks during this opening session of the side event that is titled Leveraging Modern Energy Access for All, Infrastructure, Climate and Cooking. We begin from recognizing that universal access to affordable, reliable and modern energy services by 2030 is a prerequisite and a catalyst for improving the living and working condition of all the world's people, especially the poorest and the most vulnerable populations who lack any modern energy services. Significantly increasing the pace of electrification and clean cooking uh, expansion efforts is an urgent matter. Globally, electricity access rate in access deficit countries must increase from 82% in 2019 to 94 by 2025 in order to achieve 100% access by 2030, which is the, the, the target for the SDG7. Since 2013, Kenya has achieved accelerated access to electricity. This has been driven by multiple strategies and interventions including favorable policy and regulatory frameworks. Last mile connectivity program, rural electrification program, as well as the slum electrification program, and the private sector led solar off grid electricity interventions. Particularly the use of mobile uh, money platforms, including pay as you go business models have been particularly instrumental. And so as a result, electrification connectivity rapidly grew from 29% in 2013 to about 77% in 2020. We have a national goal of attaining universal access to electricity by 2025. The transition to modern energy cooking services is expected to result in substantive adoption of electric cooking appliances, particularly in sub-Saharan African countries, such as Kenya. This anticipated adoption in Kenya follows the last mile connectivity project, which increased electricity connectivity in rural areas where biomass is still used as a cooking fuel. Currently, a number of projects, including uh, Kenya off-grid solar access project, promotion of climate-friendly cooking, which is supported by the Green Climate Fund, and national biogas program, among others, are being implemented. Their successful implementation will further increase access. The Ministry of Energy is in the process of finalizing the development of integrated national energy planning framework. The integrated energy planning addresses the full suite of household energy needs, including targets for clean cooking. 
Integration of cooking needs into electrification planning would strengthen the profitability of decentralized and centralized grids and provide significant health and livelihood benefits. Kenya commits to shift to clean cooking through continuous development of efficient cooking solutions. This will, in addition, provide a range of social, economic, and environmental co benefits. We have set a national target of 2028 to achieve universal access to modern cooking energy services. And this is uh, what we are now following up with the bioenergy strategy, which has been developed to guide this process. So in conclusion, we would like to urge governments, investors, businesses, and other key stakeholders to align with a greater sense of urgency and innovation, elevating clean cooking within energy, climate, and development agenda. With these few remarks, we would like to wish the deliberations to be successful, and we look forward to the outputs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you very much to to Charlotte for your uh, remarks, and and thank you for kicking off our for setting the scene and and help us to kick off our event. Uh, Joni, uh, could you please put up the presentation? Yeah, so before we head on to the panel discussion, um, I wanted us to look back at why uh, we've organized this session together with our partners in the first place. Now, we all know that the 2030 deadline for achieving universal energy access is, is approaching fast. With less than a decade to go, we, we need ambitious commitments to really accelerate access to modern energy cooking solutions to achieve SDG 7, but also to secure a net zero carbon future for cooking. Now, as progress has been made on increasing access to modern energy, we as partners really saw a, an opportunity to capitalize on these gains to transition to clean cooking. Now, this can only happen if we address the following. And infrastructure. Now, currently, national planning does not always include cooking loads. But according to recent studies and pilots, cooking on energy efficient appliances has now become cheaper than charcoal. If we look at the environmental aspects, charcoal around cities is the main source of deforestation. With increasing urbanization, in particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, it is critical that we cater for the use of polluting fuels and offer modern energy cooking solutions for all. Now, cooking is a primary use of polluting fuels, causing severe health and environmental impacts, yet it's still not integrated in modern energy planning. Now, based on these developments, our plea here really is that going forward, moving towards a net zero carbon future, we call on national planning committees and utilities to integrate cooking in modern energy infrastructure. We urge that national determined contribution and DCs need to include that integration of cooking within their targets. So our panel discussion today includes uh, a number of experts from all different backgrounds who've shown that they're thinking and really planning ahead on how to transition to clean cooking whilst laying the groundwork for a net zero carbon future. Um, I have the pressure now to introduce Donny Alexander, who's the Senior Director of Evidence and Impact at the Clean Cooking Alliance. Um, she will moderate the session for us today, so I'll quickly hand over to Donny. Over to you, Donny. Sorry, turning myself off mute there. Thank you so much, Dupri, and really um, important and I think very um, timely introductions as we as we talk about, you know, the road to 2030 clean cooking um, and electric cooking is going to be a, a really important part of that. And so today's panel, which, as Shukri mentioned, has so many experts and um, deep country experience on it will really highlight what are some of the lessons learned, what are the challenges that we still face, and, and what are the perspectives uh, of how we're going to, to be able to really scale up electric cooking. So 
As has been mentioned, it is a very, very um, deep panel. So we're not going to get into to everything. It's just want to show the breadth of what is really happening in, in the sector. So I encourage you, the, the people who are joining, to reach out to, to the MEX team or to the panelists with any um, questions that you may have that we may not get to. And for the panelists, again, we there are eight of you, so really we, we need to keep this to three or four minutes because we have uh, only 45 minutes for this session. So I'm going to kick it off right now. The first uh, the first person I'd like to call on is Maxine Jordan from the inner from the she's an energy policy analyst from IEA from the International Energy Agency. So Maxine, can you share more about IEA's perspective on the potential cooking with electricity and the challenges and opportunities that you have experienced so far um, in your organization? Thank you. Thank you, Danny, and, and hi, everyone. So I'll start off by talking a little bit of um, about one of our, our recent publications, so the IEA Net Zero Roadmap which outlines a narrow but a feasible pathway to net zero emissions by 2050. And the analysis clearly shows that achieving the two goals of decarbonization of the global economy by 2050 and providing affordable, reliable and clean energy services for all by 2030 really can go hand in hand. And we also believe that a clean energy transition, it just isn't a successful one if it doesn't involve people. In fact, it's for people and about people. And for people to adopt alternative cleaner fuels, it's critical for them uh, to be involved um, on the journey. So the, the transition simply won't be successful if we don't, because it's people that consume energy, not the buildings that they're, that they're in or the, or the cars that they drive. So this is why the IEA has convened the Global Commission on People-Centered Clean Energy Transitions, which examines how citizens can benefit from the opportunities and navigate through the disruptions caused by a shift to a clean energy economy. It's chaired by energy ministers of Denmark and Senegal, who are coordinating the Commission members' recommendations as we speak. And if you'd like to be involved in the survey and any of the events coming up, I invite you to head to the IEA website to find out more. And I mention this because cooking really is one of those delicate areas where the acceptability of solutions is really essential, as it happens in all of our homes um, and, and is intimately tied to culture. And so clearly electric cooking certainly looks to offer significant potential benefits for all sorts of economies, whether it displaces gas or LPG or traditional biomass, uh, with the benefits ranging from improving energy security and reducing import or subsidy bills, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions or improving health, living standards and socioeconomic development. But when we look at the applicability of, say, electric pressure cookers, so the most efficient uh, form of electric cooking, the first question is always, can we cook our traditional dishes in this device? And it turns out that the question is actually much more, the answer to that question is actually much more nuanced than a simple yes or no. So there's been some really great work in gathering evidence on the benefits of electric cooking and um, its acceptability. Um, and potential penetration. Um, and uh, this evidence has been well documented by, by field, tri field trials by MEX and others, and some that we've been involved with ourselves, uh, particularly on electric pressure cookers. And these show that um, these devices could be very well suited to certain cooking processes. Um, and what I found particularly interesting is that even if a particular electric device can't fulfill all of a household's cooking needs, it may be used for a share of cooking. And this really um, this, first of all, this is completely normal uh, because we all use a combination of fuels and devices. And this is really where more evidence and field trials, trials really help us to increase the nuance in the conversation about the suitability of electric devices, which will enable more robust hypotheses of how much of cooking can or can't be shifted to electricity. So what we're really, we're really interested in the promising developments shown um, on the affordability and availability and suitability of electric devices. We are aware that there are some risks associated with a large uptake uh, or large push on electric cooking, especially if all of the stakeholders are not brought along. Um, some examples of these risks include the impact on electricity grids, impact on household electricity bills, how to ensure the quality and efficiency of the actual products, and how, of course, to finance their deployment, um, among many others. 
So these are areas that we're really looking forward to understanding more about from this community uh, because the potential is, is just simply so great. Um, so thanks, and I look forward to, to, to the rest of the discussion. Yeah, thanks, Maxine. That was that was excellent. And I think um, really thinking about the whole house solution and uh, is really important and also the risks, uh, as you say, um, there are grid issues and things like that 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 need to be thought out. So so we can have really um, strong scale up of these solutions that are actually sustainable. So that was really, really helpful. Um, the next person I'd like to to call on is Madhusudan Adhikarhi. He's the executive director of the Alter Alternative Energy Promotion Center from the government of Paul. And I have personally had a lot of experience working with Madhusudan, and he is such a, an advocate for clean cooking um, in his country and also for electric cooking. So. Um, Madhusudan, it would be great to understand um, Nepal has really set ambitious countrywide clean cooking targets. I think they could be models for what other countries could do. And much of these targets focus on electric cooking. Can you discuss why Nepal prioritized electric cooking? And uh, can you also talk a little bit about how Nepal um, will go about trying to achieve these targets and the barriers that you think need to be overcome in order to reach this goal? Uh, thank you, Tony. Can you hear me? You can you, you hear me? Yep, we hear you well. We hear you well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, distinguished uh, panelist, um, yes, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, yes, we are working closely with CCA also, so you have a lot of information on what we are doing. We are focusing on uh, one of the primary area uh, we had a reasonable access of electricity recently. We have reached around 90% by national grid and around 3 to 4% by off-grid. So up to 93-94% of the people have electricity access. Um, and then the, the next focus is, uh, of course, modernizing the cooking because cooking is still a difficult uh, uh, process to us in um, our kind of contest. Still more than 60% of cooking comes from uh, the biomass uh, based cooking uh, solutions and uh, equipment. And then uh, the modern cooking and the urban cooking basically goes to LPG cooking, uh, which is also imported fuel to us. And less than 1% to 2% uh, in, in other devices, especially in electric cooking, we are less than 1%. Uh, in our current statistic. We had a baseline study from my organization and we got this information. So uh, there is an urgent need that we should be focusing on uh, replacing the biomass based cook solution. And then um, uh, we have to uh, improve the electric cooking status uh, because uh, sooner or later we are going to have more electricity produced than we can consume. So we will have surplus electricity uh, which is the primary source of our energy. We we import all the commercial energy from uh, abroad, so we need a lot of investment in the forex. So in that contest, um, we are um, compelled to work on these um, um, clean cooking solutions, and we have committed to SE for all by 2030. And in our next uh, 15 year, five, 15th five year plan. We have uh, a very ambitious target of improving around 2 million stoves, uh, around 500,000 from biogas, around 5,000, 500,000 from metallic stoves, and 1 uh, million from electric uh, uh, cooking uh, uh, methods. So it's a quite ambitious target we have in our 15th plan. And then um, in, in that contest, we, 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 we are um, focusing on electric cooking because, as I mentioned, uh, we import LPG, so we have to replace LPG, and we have are going to have excess electricity produced in the country. Uh, so we 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 definitely want to move into that. And to achieve that, we are um, uh, having a lot of um, in, uh, in uh, project preparation. Uh, the government itself is putting uh, uh, some money in a cooking uh, solutions. Uh, I get around um, five million rupees. Um, five million dollar uh, every year to work on cooking solutions. So it's uh, from the national um, resources, uh, domestic resources, 
uh, that's also great in in the country like ours where the the resources are still very limited we have a lot of priorities to do, uh, use our resources so getting 5 million dollar for cooking solution is great and then uh, to achieve our ambitious target of 5 15th five year plan we are pre preparing um, two three projects one is with the gcf we have um, a gcf project almost uh, uh, ready to get approved uh, it's already in CIC committee approved approval process where 1 million stoves are targeted in five years time. Out of that, 500,000 will be from, uh, will, will go to the electric cooking. We're also working with um, ISMAP, uh, though the process is on hold, but we we, we, we are planning to have 700,000 stove out of which are also 500 from electric cooking. And also we are working with um, CCA, uh, with the NAMA facilities to have another project uh, on cooking stove. So uh, I think the pipeline wise, our target and the preparation is moving uh, hand to hand in tandem. So uh, yeah, this, this uh, plus the government initiative definitely in five years time, we are not very uh, unrealistic. We are realistic, but we have to get these all uh, about materialize and uh, receive the um, projects. Uh, in the barrier side, uh, we all know this. Uh, there are a lot of uh, barriers, as uh, the previous speaker also highlighted. It's a behavioral science, depend on culture, food patterns, and of course, it is also related to gender issues. The women are the men uh, who are involved in cooking uh, and these things. So uh, there are a lot of issues, uh, barriers, a lot, lot of behavioral science effects in this thing. And the most important is still the policy in the in the terms of policy regime. And the cooking policies, improvement of cooking is not still mainstream in many countries, including Nepal. So we are pushing government to have very explosive uh, policies to encourage modern cooking and especially electric cooking. And then uh, the infrastructure for electric cooking it is an issue. Uh, we all developing countries have struggled to bring some form of electricity to the villages, but uh, the, the infrastructure, supply, quality, safety, and reliability and timely availability for electric cooking is uh, the second issue on supply side. Then of course, um, uh, the, the, the affordability of the cost of electric cooking, yeah. the, the electricity cost uh, to the developing countries, especially in the bottom of the pyramid um, people, uh, the cost yeah. of electricity is, is, is a big issue because the electricity is available, but the price to pay is not uh, easily can arrange by many. Then, of course, we have also and I think. Yeah, just because we, go ahead. I just because we have so many panelists, I want to I do want to recognize we have six others, but I think you really hit every single issue and it's really important just to summarize here. Uh, we need funding from the government and, and from outside organizations, um, the GCF and others to, to make sure that that money is going into this issue, but also there are supply and demand side barriers that need to be addressed. And you really highlighted very nicely all of the things that need to come together in order for us to scale up. So I really, I, I commend Nepal's efforts on this. I think this is one in which you really took taken a holistic approach and, and um, have what is necessary in order to move in the right direction. So, so thank you, uh, Mother Sudan, for joining us. Um, next, I'd like to move to Daniel Boucher from uh, GIZ. He's the Director of um, Energizing Development from INDEV. Um, and my question to you, Daniel, is, is INDEV has piloted electric cooking with some promising results. And, and I think um, these, these pilots have really kind of showed you what are some of the barriers and what is needed to go to scale. And what are the actors required to, to make this happen? So it would be great to hear from GIZ, your perspectives on how we're going to move in this direction. Yeah, many thanks, uh, Donny, and also um, good evening, good day to all the colleagues joining the session uh, after actually already a packed day uh, of the HLDE material. Um, yeah, many thanks for, for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of uh, the multi donor and multi implementer partnership energizing development. Um, you know, some, some say NDEF has its boot on the ground, and maybe I would say NDEF can contribute a, a practical perspective to the discussion um, based on operations in more than 20 countries and having provided energy access to almost uh, 24 million people until today. Um, 
Yeah, and it works broadly across access to electricity as well as cooking energy. And in cooking, and it focuses on cleaning the stack, which was also mentioned as a concept before, and along the full range of fuels and tiers, as also many of you know. Um, and many also of you know that NF has a quite strong portfolio on efficient use of biomass. But in addition, NF has also a track record on biogas, ethanol, and more recently, more recently on electric cooking. Um, I think for a program such as NF, you know, being in the field for more than 15 years, it's, it's really exciting to see the dynamics of, of e-cooking. And I would say not long ago, um, the landscape looked very different and e-cooking was not really regarded as serious or marketable option in the context of our work. Um, and, and I'm honest if I'm saying uh, that included also particularly me and others from the team who had their concerns if this is really something that can go to scale. But let's also be frank, I think this has changed and uh, Max has also played a crucial role in advocating for this. And I'd really like to advocate um, and compliment the colleagues who have who've done their role in, in, in paving the way for e-cooking in this discussion. Um, so what do we do? Coming to your question. So NF is supporting early movers and has piloted e-cooking interventions in Nepal and Kenya. Uh, focus in Nepal was on induction stove, also in a grid connected scenario. In Kenya, the focus was on electric pressure cookers um, in on-grid and off-grid settings. And I would say that the results of the pilots show opportunities and are also promising, but at the same time, the remaining challenges in a scalable approach. And a key challenge from a perspective such as the program as NDEF is to make e-cooking accessible to the poor, and of course, also to the very poor, and particularly in, in rural and you know, even more so in remote off-grid areas. Um, I mean, we are happy to share insights in our experience on market readiness for e-cooking solutions. And while I'm saying this, we're rolling out further e-cooking interventions in Bangladesh, in Cambodia, DRC, Mozambique, Rwanda, Tanzania, and we continue to do so in Nepal and Kenya. And we're scoping in Benin, Ethiopia, and Uganda. So actually, we're covering about half of our portfolio with e-cooking interventions. Um, and let me conclude with a call to action, actually. Um, so the entire family, I think, from NDEF side is ready to team up more broadly to engage in e-cooking. And for this, we need to get more partners on board as movers and shakers. And uh, this includes the private sector and banks and MFIs, but particularly also governments and utilities and investors. And I'm really encouraged, by the way, also uh, Nepal and Kenya were making the case. And for good reasons, these were two countries we were pioneering in. Um, but let's go beyond pilots. And we want to test different market settings and go to scale. And I would say EDNF is ready to team up and let's make it happen. Yeah, that's excellent. And I agree 100%. I think in order for us to, to really make progress, bringing these resources together so we're not duplicating and and pro and I will say, having worked with INDEF for many years, you do bring that practical perspective and really help um, those of us who are sitting in DC understand what is happening on the ground. And that's really important because that last mile distribution is incredibly uh, it's a hard, a hard nut to crack. It is very challenging. So um, uh, we'll, I think from CCA's perspective, we need to circle back and think about how we uh, focus more on this and also with MEX as well. So, so very nice. Um, the next person I'd like to, to have speak is Nick Hurd, who is the former UK Member of Parliament and Senior Advisor to BBOX. And so it's really a pleasure to have you joining today, Nick. And you bring... Um, I think a little bit broader perspective to this uh, discussion. And so I'm really excited to hear from you about how, how does the politics of the Paris Agreement affect and impact clean cooking or how does you know clean cooking play a role in that? And why is it important to connect um, clean cooking with the low carbon agenda? And so this would be really great to hear just a little bit broader on, on how do we how do we get involved in the major kind of movement of, of the you know Paris Agreement? Um, because I think that is a very important piece of this kind of puzzle. So thank you. It is, thank you. And so I, I look at this through two lenses. The first, as you said, is as a former UK Minister for Climate Change and a former UK Minister for International uh, Development, but now uh, advising uh, BBOX, um, you know, which is a company that has a 10-year record of connecting over a million people to clean electricity. We're very proud of that, but we're just as committed now to um, uh, connecting uh, customers in, in our core markets to, 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 to clean cooking. And the underlying question here then is how do we uh, mobilize political leadership and investment flow, which just is not there, you know, I mean, we have to be very frank, the data shows that we're way off track 
SDG 7 and in relation to clean cooking, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, we're going backwards. So uh, something needs to, to, to change. And most of us on this call would love to see a political reaction to our public health crisis, which is what we're looking at, comparable in its death count to COVID. We'd love to see a comparable political reaction, but we are not. And therefore, uh, we have to be you know, brutally realistic in sniffing the political wind and looking at where and how our agenda uh, can be made more politically relevant to political leadership and to corporate leadership. And, and that, that instinct takes us to the climate agenda. And it's, it's very clear we're in a different phase now of, 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 of genuine movement towards real climate ambition, see all the language, race to net zero, just, in, just an inclusive recovery. They're saying all the right things. They're making all the right uh, commitments. And that is where the political capital is. That is where the money is gathering both from the, from in terms of international climate finance, but also increasingly from uh, carbon finance, from uh, the, 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 the corporate sector. And we have a political wind of opportunity with COP26, but also critically COP27 based in Africa. I would say we have a two or three year political opportunity to make a case, assert our political relevance to the Paris agenda uh, and, and uh, the global movement towards, uh, towards both net zero and critically adaptation and greater resilience building to inevitable uh, climate change. And my second point is we are relevant. You know, the data shows that uh, greenhouse gas emissions from non-renewable wood fuels alone totals uh, a giga gigaton of greenhouse gas emissions a year. That's 2% of the global challenge. It's not a huge number, but it's a significant number. Pile on that, a big proportion of global uh, black carbon emissions, I think around a quarter, and then link the carbon agenda to the, to the nature biodiversity agenda. And at the G7, there was a G7 nature compact for the first time, political leadership increasingly concerned about the biodiversity crisis. We know, as presentations already said, uh, dirty cooking is a, one of the main drivers of deforestation, particularly around uh, cities. So we have a relevant narrative to present to both political and corporate leadership about the relevance of the, 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 the transition to clean cooking fuels that is not just a public health narrative, not just an economic narrative, uh, not just an inclusivity uh, gender imperative, but also an environmental imperative. And that's why finally, you know, Bbox and I personally very, very happy to support and lean in uh, and help draft the Clean Cooking Manifesto that's circulating that Max and others have been leading on, which calls specifically for clean cooking to be integrated into uh, national uh, energy planning. But critically, we should be encouraging countries like DRC, for example, to incorporate clean cooking into their NDCs, to take that to the COP, to ask for international support and use targets and plans developed with the support of international uh, donors and supporters uh, to, to, to craft NDCs around which public-private partnerships and compacts could be structured with tangible commitments to support real plans. In the absence of that, I feel we will continue to drift. Yeah, that, that was really so well said. And I think so much to unpack there because really without this major investment and the political and corporate will to actually um, invest into this situation, I, I agree with you, we're gonna continue to lag. And I think one of the things that compels me about clean cooking is the solutions to providing climate and health benefits are not, um, they, they they are also something that the user, the consumer wants, right? We're not taking something away. Um, we're, we're providing them with modern technologies and, and uh, um, you know, reducing the time they spend and all of those things. So it's there are so many co-benefits to clean cooking, but jumping on the political kind of, um, you know, bandwagon right now, I think is, is imperative. So thank you so much, Nick. That was really nice. Next, I'd like to move to Michelle Halleck. She is a senior economist from the Inter-American Development Bank, and she's been um, you know, working, I think, obviously in, in Latin America, but she has experience with rolling out e-cooking in Ecuador. And this is one of the first places where we've seen countries really switch from you know, LPG and move to electricity. And so it'd be really great to, to hear your experiences with this, because I think 
there are so many lessons learned there as being kind of the pioneer in this space. And so if you could share more about those results and, and what are the lessons learned from this and, and how would you kind of shift going forward um, if you were to kind of look at other countries with similar, um, you know, that could actually transition to electric. So Michelle, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's an uh, amazing discussi discussion. One of the things that we want to start to underline is that the importance of clean cooking uh, for Latin America and Caribbean. We know that um, after transport industry, as was mentioned, residential cooking and heating, it's a major source of our pollution in lack and it's about 15% of the population that's still suffer from that. So that's something really important for us. And when you think about IDB vision, uh, what we, we expect for the next five years, uh, there's two topics that um, goes together with clean cooking. One of them, it's uh, all the dimension of um, climate change that was mentioned before, but also the gender. Gender is something really important for our vision in the next years, and it's one of the motivations for us to really um, uh, be, be pushing these topics. And when you think about solutions, uh, I guess, as you said, Ecuador, it's an interesting case because it's it shows that it's possible to have a scalable adoption relatively quickly of e-cooking, and it may make economic sense for countries and governments to push the solution. And so let's talk a little bit about, um, about this case. Ecuador is an interesting case study because it has been subsiding uh, LPG since the 70s. Uh, and in 2001, the cylinder was allowed around 1.6 uh, US dollars, regardless of international price. So it actually means a, a big subsidy and it starts to be really heavy for a government. Um, and as we know, phase out subsidies is always complicated uh, for every country. So the government was trying actually to find a solution to incentivize, as you just said, not to to, to push people, but to give incentive for them to nudge them to change the technology and try to, to solve the problem. So it's a kind of a, a really smart uh, program trying to, to think how, about how to move forward in, so, in solving a, a problem that they had. So what was basically the program? The program will have uh, three main pillars. The first one, it was offering subsidies of electricity credit between 80 kilowatts hour per month if you are just cooking and you have additional 20 if you also choose um, electrical heater. So second, the stove and the cooker purchase benefit from the reduced price with an attractive payment plan. So, And the third one, you have also uh, a relation with the human development uh, bond that also help uh, through a conditional cash and transfer program to people who have the lowest income. So what to achieve? Um, after you have more details in the program, they will be happy to, 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 to discuss, but I, I go to the results and the lessons. Um, we achieved uh, between 2014 and 2017 more than 596,000 of induction cooker installed. 97% it was correspond to kitchen installation and 3% it was kitchen and um, water heaters. Uh, from this, uh, we have uh, 7,000 that were uh, free of charge with human development bond. It means that most of it, really most of it is not uh, given. It was through this kind of program that people pay um, accordingly. Uh, you have six, uh, six, seven percent of this kitchen was installed, was produced in local companies, which also an important part of this program related with jobs and all the discussion of green recovery right now. So that's a, a important point as well. And uh, you have a kind of uh, it was more than 101 million of LPG subsides avoided. It's a rough estimation, but just to have an idea about that and some results of this program. So this program is really exciting, as you just mentioned, because it's big and it was quite quick, but in 2018 it stopped. So what you can learn? 
first uh, when you see that the program stopped to give most of the benefits of for adoption, the adoption stopped. So it did not create some track that goes um, along, uh, but it was expected. But what we want to look uh, closer, actually, it was to see if people keep using. So we know that people adopted and it was a really important step on this program, but how people use these cook stoves and what happened with these people. So we have some preliminary results that I want to share with you here, but of course we need to have um, much more deep studies to understand the behavior. So what we see, we see that, and it's quite interesting because talking with people there, there's different hypotheses about what happened with the program. So when you look at the data, it's really interesting to see what of these hypotheses make sense and the others that need to be better look at that. Um, the first one is that um, the program should consider policies after adoption. And I will discuss a little bit more about that. What to observe that it's the program was adopted and people actually start to use electricity. So the, there is an increase, there is a statistically significant increase of electricity consumption for people who uh, adopt the program compared to if he did, didn't adopt the program um, and in all the different income. So it means that when people actually receive the cook stove, they start to use it. However, what to observe that after one year, we have a decrease of this use of electricity. And for some groups, and that's especially true for lower income groups. So we observe that there is a decrease of this. What we know, uh, is that actually people keep their old cook stoves in their house. That's something that happened. And what we, we can, the way you try to explain this kind of results is that especially for low income uh, groups, um, we have a challenge associated with stoves man maintaining behavior and replacement of pans. This could explain why the people who start to use it decrease the use of this stove for some groups. And this is something that we should improve when look next steps for the program. So it's not just the adoption, it's not just the first step, but we need to be able to see how people change their behavior and keep using these electrical stoves. That's, I guess it's one of the, the main um, lessons. But what we observe is that actually the adoption worked. So that's a, the good thing. And also uh, many people was talking, oh, people will use electricity for other things. And we test for many things, for weather, for air condition, this kind of thing. And we didn't see any evidence of misbehavior. So the program actually were directly to cook stove. So also it was a really good lesson uh, from this program. So we will be happy to share and discuss more about that. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm muting myself there. That's really fascinating. And I think even for those of us who've been working on this issue for so long, that behavior change clear down to the actual implements and the and the pots and pans, you know, affordability is going to continue to be an issue. So we have to look at long term solutions to ensure that we transition people, you know, for for good. And so that's really an important lesson learned. And I think as we think of other countries like Nepal or others who have the potential to scale, scale up elect, electric, electric cooking, those lessons learned are really important. So thank you so much, Michelle. That was that was really insightful and I think really shows us that that, you know, with the right kind of subsidy structure and support from the government, that these programs do have a potential to work. We've just got to look at long long term sustainability. So that was really um, insightful. Thank you. So next, I'd like to go to Tom Morton. He is the director of climate care, and this is really a very interesting um, piece that he is working on. And I think also really important as we think about how do we make these more affordable. So he, um, Tom, you're working together with Max to develop a new methodology to unlock carbon credits for clean cooking. I would love for you to speak more about that initiative and how you think we can climate uh, capitalize on the climate financing 
to make clean cooking solutions more affordable and accessible for all. And I think this methodology is just one example. So if you could go into that and how it will reduce the transaction cost, that would be that would be great. Great, thank you very much, uh, Donnie, for that introduction. And I just actually like to start by congratulating uh, Nick Hurd. I haven't um, heard him speak before, but um, I thought that he really brought out into the open the scale of the challenge that we have. And I think, in fact, in talking about the fact that biomass from cooking only accounts for 2% of greenhouse gas emissions probably uh, underestimates uh, the scale of the challenge that we have, particularly here in countries such as Kenya, where 70% of the energy used in the entire country uh, still comes from biomass. And of course, with some of our neighbours, that goes up as high as 97% of all of all energy used comes from um, biomass, which is largely non-renewable. Uh, and if Kenya is going to reach uh, its Paris targets, then that needs to change. And I think um, electric cooking uh, offers a great um, opportunity and in fact one of the questions in 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 the chat from um, Barbara was about what are the barriers that need to be overcome and I think one of the biggest barriers here is that electricity is seen as two things it's seen as expensive and it's seen as unreliable and um, therefore people would not dream of cooking on it and I think that one of the things that MEX has done is really shown how how energy efficient um, cooking on uh, modern electric appliances can be and cooking on 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 um, uh, uh, an electric pressure cooker can perhaps cost 10 percent or less of cooking your meal on uh, charcoal and don't forget that a household cooking on charcoal has greenhouse gas emissions of five tons of co2 a household so let's not forget that in our discussion about the paris agreement and the common narrative that um, households in Africa in particular do not have any greenhouse gas emissions. Those narratives only count the fossil fuels and they do not count the non-renewable biomass. So here we have this uh, opportunity with um, electricity and one of the things that we've always done um, at Climate Care is to finance um, clean cooking programmes through the sale of uh, the emission reductions that are achieved by reducing that five tonnes of CO2 per, per, per household. And um, taking a project through carbon finance is, is complex. And so one of the things that we uh, have endeavoured to do with some funding from MEX, for which we're very grateful, is to simplify one of the key methodologies um, for um, demonstrating those emissions reductions. And one of the key things that we have for the first time with these modern solutions is that we can measure the actual use the actual energy used in the project on a household by household basis, which gives us a great granularity of data that we have never had before. And we can then use that to uh, demonstrate the emissions reductions and then sell those either to other countries who need them to reach their Paris targets or the increasing number of corporates who want to compensate for their greenhouse gas emissions. And that is my three minutes, 10 seconds. Thank you. No, that was so excellent. And what I think that <laughs> does, um, honestly, um, Tom, is it provides so much more credibility to those carbon offsets, right? If we actually have the data that is being used through a device, right? Instead of going out there and estimating and, and the methodologies that have existed have had have come with, you know, some 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 challenges, both transaction cost wise, but also transparency and credibility. I think this is a game changer in that it actually will provide that transparency and credibility to the actual offsets that you're selling. And that is really, really important. And reducing transaction costs, which is been has been a real challenge for implementers and trying to get into the carbon market because it can be so onerous to go out there and collect all of that data. So this is really, really important as we think about scaling clean cooking, especially electric cooking. We need to think about the carbon market as as Nick alluded to. That is that is the climate space is really important for us to be in. And this is one way in which we can do that. So that's that's excellent. Um, thank you. And I'm excited to 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 see to start seeing that in action, to see um, implementers and others use these methodologies and actually get them going, because that cannot always 
that is always a challenge. So that will be nice to see what kind of happens with this space. So next, I'm really pleased to, to welcome Wairimu Kimani, excuse me, um, Nahia, I apologize there. Um, she is the manager for the Pika Na Power Program, so of Kenya Power. And Wairimu, it is great to have you. And what is really interesting is Kenya Power is, um, your Cook with Electricity program is about to roll out electric appliances for cooking or is rolling them out. And it would be great to hear another country experience. What are the experiences of the consumers um, so far in cooking with electricity? Um, it would be nice to understand from the consumer perspective how they feel about cooking with electricity, what you're experiencing there. So um, welcome and, and it'll be, um, I'm pleased to hear what your thoughts are on this side of things. Thank you. Can you see me? Yeah, we see you well. Thank you. All right. Um, yes, we have a pick and a power program that we do. We started in 2017. And uh, our main aim was to introduce cooking with electricity to our over 8 million customers. So we have cookery classes, free cookery classes that we hold. We have a fully fledged uh, uh, cooking theater which I think some of you may have seen when you came for the Clean Cooking Alliance. You may have joined us for our cookery show. And our experience is that um, most people have the perception, like I think every, what I've heard with other speakers as well, is that electricity is very, very expensive to cook with. So it, has, it was never a thought that I could cook with electricity. Electricity to them was just for lighting purposes, so you have 8 million customers who are using one unit, two units, you know, in the semi-urban areas. So we are like, what are they doing with this power? They just watch, you know, TV, radio. But once we started doing the cookery classes and doing something we call power clinics, power clinics, we go out to the to stations, you know, we could go to the chief's place, to the uh, uh, hall in an area, you know, deep out of town. And we set up and we talk to them about electricity and I do demonstrations, some live demonstrations on um, cooking, just simple dishes. And they're like, wow, we can cook with electricity. And of course we have meters that we um, hook up to the appliances. So we have this popular dish, which we call a uh, githeri, maize and beans, which is a, a staple food. And it usually takes hours to cook. So when I show them that they can use an electric pressure cooker, for example, and cook, within 40 minutes unattended and less than 10 shillings. And yet they use uh, charcoal, which is their main fuel, uh, to cook the same dish, which would cost them like 200 shillings. So the minute that penny hits home, it's, it's, it's a home run. And we are good with that. And people are buying and joining um, us with uh, the wish to have them all cooking with electricity. So it's doing very well. And thanks to Max, we have a, pro a TV program which we feature in called Shamba Shape Up. So we reach a, quite a number of viewers. Actually, it's one of the national uh, stations. So we reach very, very many viewers and they're really interested. So the uptake is there and uh, people are shifting to moving to cooking with electricity. And more importantly, that it frees them up to do other things. That is something that is really working with them. You know, a lady is like, wow, I can go do my chores as this cooks for me, then that's really good. And then the men also, when it comes to gender, the men are really excited to buy this uh, pressure cooker for their homes because they are the people who are paying the bills. So if I demonstrate to them that they can use much less, budget less for fuel, they buy the EPCs for their wives and their homes and even some of the single men really buy it. So I hope I've answered your question. And the... Yeah. We are having good experience with them. Yeah, and it, it, I, I thank you, Wairimo. And it really brings in the importance of um, the, you know, really looking at the demand creation and the behavior change because it is new technology. It's not something people are used to. So those demonstrations really showing, right? If you tell me that, you know, some product is better than another, I probably won't purchase it. But if I can see the actual, um, you know, results, and so things like that are really going to be important as we look at 
transitioning people from biomass yes. to electricity. And that yes. is the consumer and the user is so important in this equation. And, and I think what, what you're doing at Kenya Power is, is really, really, um, you know, transformative and will actually help us to see uptake of, of electric cooking. So that's, that's excellent. Thank we are um, running behind as we expect it to be. So we have one speaker left and then we're going to go to the closing. So those questions that have come in, we will keep those. If you want to put your email on there, we can respond to you. Um, or I, I encourage you to reach out to the MEX team. So I, I do apologize, but I want to give the speakers the time to talk because they really are um, just providing so much uh, useful information today. So we're going to close with Manajit Pal, and he's the division manager of um, energy efficiency and clean cooking. Um, at the African Development Bank. And, and he's really been in this space for quite a while. And I think um, it would be great to, to hear, Manojit, what is the bank's perspective on cooking with electricity? And can you ex share your experiences and future plans for expanding this? And also maybe touch on, you know, where this perspective is now versus 10 years ago. I, I wonder if you, you've seen a kind of shift in perspective. So Manojit, over to you. Thank you, Donnie. Uh, well, actually, compared with uh, most other institutions, including people like Endev uh, on this call, uh, the bank's uh, focus on clean cooking is relatively recent. So I'd say we go back about four years. Um, and as we entered the space about four years ago, it was very clear to us that the, the ecosystem is essentially made up of many small and micro and uh, medium scale enterprises. And uh, for us to sort of engage with that, we would need to take a financial intermediation approach. Uh, which means going through banks, working through you know, specific facilities. Uh, and indeed, in that context of financial intermediation, we are working with the Alliance and, and other partners uh, to try and establish a fund that will uh, you know, contribute towards the needs of this uh, very diverse ecosystem. However, this, this uh, financial intermediation approach is extremely different from our traditional approach in the energy sector, where we've taken a utility-centric model. Um, and so we've been also thinking about how can we bring this closer to our, within quotes, core operations. Um, and, and I think you know, electric cooking is potentially an opportunity in, in that context. Um, in terms of the bank's uh, energy access work, which is electricity access traditionally, uh, we focused and continue to focus on um, uh, last mile access, for instance. Uh, in, in Kenya, we've been working with Kenya Power since 2014 um, on their last mile access program. And I think we've rolled out over half a million connections by now, and it's a program that's going well. So it's in that context that it makes sense for us to explore how to integrate clean cooking, and in particular, the deployment of efficient appliances such as uh, electric pressure cookers. Uh, it's not necessarily a new approach uh, for utilities, and, and you know there is some experience on the continent. For instance, South Africa, as ESCOM has rolled out hot plates and kettles in the past. Um, uh, but the other thing to also sort of think about as as one pushes electric cooking is to sort of is is the type of appliances. The appliances have to be the right appliances. Uh, we are running. Um, a residential energy usage survey in Ethiopia as we speak, and, and the preliminary data coming out of that shows a uh, fairly high usage of electricity for cooking. Um, and one of the factors there is a uh, cooker for, um, for injera, which is a staple in Ethiopia. It's called a mitad cooker. And it seems that many of these are not particularly efficient, which means if you extrapolate the load across the city, uh, this is already preliminary and, and we need to get into this further, but it, it raises a significant demand um, on the on the grid with attendant complications. So, so getting the right appliances onto the network is also crucial. But we can draw from experiences elsewhere. Um, uh, Tunisia, for instance, uh, has a two decade long program of rolling out solar water heaters across the country. Um, and with you know, what they call an on-bill financing program, wherein consumers pay for the solar water heater over a, a two or three year period, you know, based on you know, periodic payments that are charged there, there uh, monthly uh, utility bill, and it works very well. Uh, so one can draw from these experiences and many others as we think about how we can integrate uh, this with, you know, utility work. Um, so it's it's very good to see uh, the work that Kenya Power and MEX have undertaken with regard to promoting the use of uh, clean cooking uh, with with electricity and especially uh, electric pressure cookers. And and you know, considering our ongoing engagement with Kenya Power, both on on the access side, electricity access side thus far. Um, and work on demand side energy management, I think it makes sense for us to see how the next project that we look at, uh, that uh, Kenya Power and the bank collaborate, how we could potentially integrate 
um, clean cooking electric pressure cookers into that program. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Manoji. And I think um, I'm going to turn it over to the closing remarks, but you bring it home with it's a very good solution, but it has to be contextual. And we need to continue to think about that in the right locations with the right, you know, it is it's not going to be the only um, solution across the board, but it, it's going to play a major role and continue to to increase in that um, over time, I think. So that's that's very helpful. Um, now we're going to go to closing remarks and we have um, two two great uh, speakers. I would love to introduce Sheila Oparocha. She's the international coordinator for Energia and really probably the biggest gender expert in our sector and so brings a, a very important perspective to this. So Sheila, I will I will uh, pass it over to you for closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dani. Um, uh, let me start by saying Energia is um, honored to collaborate with the government of Kenya and with others uh, in organizing this event. Uh, distinguished participants, um, as we have heard, um, I think we can all agree that with 4 billion people still lacking access to modern energy cooking yeah. services and the 230 deadline for achieving universal energy access just nine years away, we need ambitious commitments for ensuring this is inclusive of cooking energy. And we need to lay the groundwork for the net zero carbon world of 2050. Uh, Donny, if you don't mind, can I just check if uh, you can hear me or if I should switch off my video? We hear you very well, Sheila. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. I'm in Zambia, so I was just checking the connectivity. Um, yeah. Over the past hour or so, uh, we have heard some really exciting perspectives on a fundamentally different way of approaching a massive global challenge, using electricity for cooking. Uh, over the past three years, although I heard uh, Africa Development Bank saying four years, but over the past three years, there's been a strong new movement that has emerged, which is asking the international community to take the opportunities embodied in the promotion of electric cooking seriously. The evidence has shown new, highly efficient electric cooking devices can make electric cooking more and more affordable. These devices fit the uh, changing taste and lifestyle of rapidly urbanizing uh, populations across Africa and Asia, as we heard from Kenya Power, uh, but also women's aspirations for progressive cooking technology. Electricity will provide the long-term solution to decarbonizing cooking as the international community embraces the greening of electricity generation. But perhaps most importantly, electricity cooking offers the opportunity for rapid scaling through its incorporation into existing electrification programs with a kind of large budgets with dwarf the amounts available for separate clean cooking programs. Drawing upon this, the organizers of this session would like to set a challenge to the uh, international community. We have formulated this as 40, 60 by 30. 40, 60 by 2030 is a rallying call to ensure that gains in modern energy access are inclusive of its use for cooking while working towards low carbon solutions. This will give health, gender, environmental and economic gains. 4020 by 30 has two major components. First, we call for a target of 40% of all households connected to grid or off-grid electricity to be using it for cooking by 2030. Why? While well, SDG 7 progress reports show that 760 million do not have access to uh, electricity, there are over 2 billion people who do have access to an electricity connection and yet continue to cook with polluting fuels. While over 96% of households in developing Asia have electricity connections, less than 30% of them cook with modern energy. In sub-Saharan Africa, my continent, just less than 50% of households have some access to electricity, and yet less than 10% have access to modern energy cooking. Secondly, we call for a target of 60% of those utilizing modern energy cooking to be utilizing energy generated from low carbon sources by 2030. Why? Cooking with polluting food accounts for 2% of carbon emissions, but a much higher proportion of black carbon emissions. As modern energy systems pivot towards renewable energy technologies, the access to clean cooking can match an improved access to low carbon energy. Ladies and gentlemen, as already shown in, Kukri, in Shukri's presentation, these aspirational targets require integrated planning, leveraging the gains in modern energy access to be intentionally inclusive of cooking energy needs and demands. 
Research on energy efficient appliances for cooking has shown that how even on weak grids, high power loads and reliability concerns can be mitigated. Research also shows that cooking with electricity with efficient appliances can be cost effective and affordable for a significant portion of the population. Combining these aspirations, we believe that an achievable target is 40, 60 by 2030. Thank you. That is so powerful. And I think we should all really lean into that 40, 60 by 2030. That is that I think is, is something we can all strive for and, and would be just amazing if, if we could attain it. Last but not least, I would love to pass it over to Kande Yumakela. He's the co-chair of the African Europe Foundation Strategy Group on Energy and former United Nations Under Secretary General and the first special representative of the Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. Um, he has been a champion of this issue and just a remarkable voice um, for, for this. So Kande, I, I pass it over to you to close our session. I'm, I'm very excited to be with you and really excited at the conversation that I've heard and particularly pleased with the idea of a 40, 60 by 2030 uh, uh, agenda that has been launched here today. It, it brings back such memories of our struggle to get an SDG 7 established within the Sustainable Development Goals. And I want to thank our colleagues at the MEX program and all others that have given us this simple narrative, 40, 60 by 2030. That's the ambition we're looking for. What I have heard you talk about today, I just want to summarize in, in about four or five key messages. One of them, we're talking about a transition, a major transition from using biomass for cooking and heating to a world where, in fact, we're using more renewable energy generated uh, 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 electricity for cooking. That's the transition we're dreaming of, but it's a pathway and we want to make it just and inclusive. Most speakers have talked about the need for political will and uh, Nick Heard put it correctly. Why I have killing cooking been left behind in all the advocacy I have done over now two decades? It is because we lacked political will and I can tell you from what I hear the last two years, particularly the beginning of this year, the stars are aligned for us. Yeah? We have the EU Africa uh, Foundation, where I co-chair that energy strategy group with Connie Hedegaard, the former climate uh, uh, commissioner for the EU. We're driving this, energy, this agenda of clean cooking to the highest levels within the European Union and within the African political establishment. Second, we've just launched two weeks ago by WHO and the UN family, the high-level coalition for cooking first of its kind, ministers of energy and minister of health together dealing with health and energy issues, the high level coalition for health and energy. Third, we also uh, uh, just three weeks ago finalized a clean cooking manifesto, which will be launched uh, uh, very soon by the Africa Europe Foundation. Fourth, again, the same group and some others, we've been able to come up with a call for action, a very simple political call for action that will be launched at the UN General Assembly. And then also several of you on this uh, uh, forum now uh, um, uh, assisting countries to include clean cooking as part of the NDCs for COP26. So we have found ways now over years to mobilize that political will, but it has been backed by good analytics. And we want to thank our colleagues at MEX for giving us the arguments, the evidence to be able to couch the right narratives to feed into all these political platforms. Uh, uh, we've also heard talk about finance. Talk is cheap, talk is good, but we need real cash. We're not talking about aid. And what we discovered over the last two de decades, clean cooking has been treated like a charity, an aid program, or oh, throw $5 million at the problem. All right, let's make it 50 million. No, we're talking billions of dollars. We want clean cooking treated at the same level as electrification. In fact, they are the same. But clean cooking, as Nick Heard mentioned, is killing four million, a lack of clean cooking solutions is killing over four million people every year. That's a silent tsunami. So we're talking real investments, as you heard from the banker just now. But for that to happen, you need the right public policies, which means we need the political will, for example, to consider smart subsidies. They can be resource-based uh, frameworks, but 
smart subsidies. People are still too poor to, to take the clean cooking alternatives. We need to look at making charcoal and firewood more expensive. Of course, you need folks like me with the courage to say, in some locations, we make it more expensive to use charcoal and firewood so we can begin to tie in those environmental costs and the health costs, meaning maybe it's some form of taxation. Who knows who has the courage for that? But real money to deal with the problem and fiscal incentives. We need regulations. And this is where, again, the Africa Europe Foundation and several of us on this call are working now. If we're going to look at regulations for bringing in massive investments for access to elect electricity over the next decades, it is important that we have the similar regulations also bringing in massive investments for clean cooking solutions because we need the infrastructure. If it is, for example, electrification, we need the generation, we need the transmission and the distribution and the last mile connection issues. Those require regulations to attract private investment, but similar, if we need LPG, you need the infrastructure to deliver it to the homes at an affordable price. Finally, planning. In most cases, I, I have seen this through, uh, I mean, in several countries, clean cooking has not been part of the central planning for energy access or electrification. We want to change that. We want, as you plan for electrification, expansion of the grid, you're planning that mini grid, for example, for my village, add additional uh, 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 delivery of uh, electric power that can enable my people to cook and not use the wood and the charcoal they think is cheap because they don't consider the environmental implications. So I want to thank you very much. Those were the key messages I heard, but very clear. We can all rally behind very simple number, 40, 60, by 2030, we drive it because it captures everything we want to do. Those are the ambitions. The how is what you've been discussing and what I've tried to summarize. So Ed and the team, all of you, thank you very much. It's been wonderful to collaborate with you and we'll continue to do the political side of this. Analytics is good, but it has to be plugged into the, 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 the global governance debates on, on climate change and energy access, but also at the national level in the, in the policy discourse and the policy debates. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Conde. That, as always, was so eloquent and well said. And I want to thank all of the panelists today and thank everybody for staying on. We know we went over, but I think it was just one of the one of the best panels I've been on. The speakers all brought so much to this panel and showed the importance of, of really doubling down on this and, and pushing for that 40, 60 by 2030. So thank you, everybody, and have a nice day. And for those of you in Africa and Asia, evening and night, um, thanks. And uh, we're going to close now. Thank you. Bye.